Good morning again and, and welcome. Uh, what a wonderful privilege it is to be able to bring this message to you this morning. As we are moving through our series on faithfulness as the key to joy, we come now to a particular form of relationships. We've spoken about two types of relationships in previous messages, one being the proto-relationship, the prime relationship. The most important relationship of all is that relationship that reconciles us back to God, back to our Lord, back to our, our, our King. And it was through the Lord Jesus Christ that we have that relationship. The second, equally challenging, was the relationship between us and enemies. And the Bible commanding us this impossible concept to love our enemies. Last time we spoke about it, we said that this is the most extremist view of Christianity. How is it that we are, it is possible to love your enemies? The world doesn't do it. The world can't do it. It doesn't have the, the reservoir of love within them to be able to attend to that. It doesn't have the, the trust and faith in God to be able to attend to that incredible ministry. And now we come to another one. We come to one that the Bible speaks of here as charity. And it's a fascinating study. And I'm going to break into a very short theological understanding of that word and why that word is there instead of the word love. But one of the things we have noticed as we've gone through this entire series on faithfulness is that in every aspect of it, there has been a challenge. And it's not because of its lack of simplicity. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Simple, simple. Love your enemies, the command to love your enemies. Simple command, a simple choice, but not easy, is it? The same with coming to God in the, in the beginning. You know, we, we recognise the simplicity of the gospel, but it's not easy. It's not easy because for some of us, it had taken decades before we actually got to that point where we would bow our knees to the Father, to, to the Lord of glory and say, Lord, save me, save me. It's, it's, a, it's a real, it's a challenge to our pride, I guess. It's a challenge to our pride. And, and I think that was also the same case with the messages prior to that. And we began with the first message. And the first message was important that it was first because honour God first. So when we are willing to trust God at his work, at his word, this is all simple. But it ain't easy. <laughs> it ain't easy because there's a challenge to the nature of our flesh that is behind all of this that makes it difficult. It's the same here. It's the same here. The challenge that we have here is the struggle of this form of love that's spoken about. One of the things that strikes us as difficult, especially through our temporal sins, is that even though in our temporal sins we have this simplicity of confessing our sins to the Lord and him forgiving us, we still often don't come to him in that light. And when we don't do so, then there's, again, this rise of pride within our own lives. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Not many of us find it easy to pray with King David, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's a challenge, and I, and I agree that it's a challenge. I tell you, one of the, one of the greatest joys, however, is to, be not, um, to not think of yourself falsely, and this is one of the struggles that you'll find as we go through this particular study this morning, is that we often still think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, and as such, we find it very difficult to love in the particular manner that's described here in the, in the passage. The kingdom of God. The Bible tells us here that we have nothing if we have not charity. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And yet, that's how it opens, and yet how it closes is that charity never faileth. And there is an incredible link between charity, the church, and God that we're going to be seeing this morning. So let's, let's open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I praise you, dear Lord, for this opportunity. And I do in every way, dear Lord, see this as a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And I praise you, dear Father, for this privilege. 
And I ask and pray, dear Lord, that your words and your spirit would gather through the words of, these, the, of your word, of the scriptures, and administer to the hearts of us all. I pray, dear Lord, that if this is expounded correctly, Father, that in every way your work would permeate within our own lives and that we ourselves would be changed. Be with us, dear Father, and help us to see this wonderful work that you have within the scriptures. We give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing that you might notice that you might find very interesting as you're reading this is that you're looking at it going, yeah, yeah, it's love. It's talking about love, you know, charity, but it's talking about love. It's really love. The overall theme of the passage that we're speaking about this morning is reproving the Corinthian Christians of an error that they have gathered themselves into. Remember the Corinthians, so much, so much learning. The next book that we're going to be studying will be 1 Corinthians. It follows on from Romans and I think it is, it is a pertinent book. Um, but it's incredible how the Corinthian Christians were a fairly worldly Christian, um, Christian uh, people. There was, it was a number of churches that were there. But what they were doing, they were doing an over-expression of a spiritual gift. There was a specific spiritual gift that they were over-emphasizing above everything else. And they were basically demonstrating that you have this particular gift, you've got it nailed. You're all good. And it's there in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13 and 14. And there's a list with respect to it in each one of those chapters. And it's not difficult to work out that they were overusing a particular gift. Does anybody know what that gift was? Tongues. Tongues. Correct. It was an overexpression of tongues to the point that it became... Um, not a gift at all, but something that they would just manifest themselves for the sake of demonstration. And Paul was rebuking them all the way through that. And yet here, right in the middle of that rebuke, is this fascinating chapter that almost every Christian wedding today has at its wedding. But it has nothing to do with necessarily that sort of a wedding. It has to do with a particular form of love that we're going to be looking at. So We're going to do a little bit of theology this morning, and I hope you can bear with me. Love versus charity. Are you ready? All right, your thinking caps on. We're going to be looking at this because it's a good question, isn't it? I mean, modern translations don't have the word charity in it. They've got the word love. They've replaced that. Why do we have charity in the Holy Bible? Why, why, Why is that word there in place of the word love? All modern translations have removed the word charity from the New Testament other than a couple of places where it doesn't belong. For example, in the book of Acts or Matthew's Gospel. It doesn't belong there at all because the meaning of the word as God has employed it is not the same meaning that we employ today. I'll explain that in a minute. They've replaced it with the simple word love. And I saw this a number of years ago and I got very, very curious about it. I, I, I naturally asked the question, why? I mean, why is that word there and not the word love? I mean, I've done my own studies and the word behind it is the same word, the same Greek word. It's agape, or so I thought at least. And it is, it is, but in, a, in an interesting form that I didn't study, um, that I had to end up studying through. On the surface, it seemed right. The Greek word translated is the word agape, and most of you have heard that word. Um, generally, they are all translated into English as the word love. But only the King James Version and, and the ancient Wycliffe translation uses the word charity in most or all of the verses that the word charity is found in the King James Version of the Bible. Why? The first thing I did was read all the occurrences of the word charity. It turns up in 24 different verses in the New Testament. Um, And as I'm going through this, in all 24 verses of the word charity, where the word charity is used instead of the word love, there is an interesting context. Every single one of them has something to do with the church, the brethren, the gathering of the fellowship, the love between brethren. It is a very unique love. It is a love that I seen in just its context that is a love between brethren, those who are united in the church. All right? 
So just pause there for a moment and hold that thought because it's a vitally important thought to be able to understand the context of this word. Yeah, this wasn't the, the case with the simple word love. The simple word love is often seen as love between brethren, but not in this particular context. And it was really interesting. So the New Testament, the New Testament has the word love 223 times in 184 verses. The word love is all throughout the New Testament in both the gospel accounts and the church letters, and it has a mix of forms. So it's in the Gospels as well as the church letters, but it also has a mix of forms. The word love has two forms of Greek word behind it. The vast majority is the word agapeo. agapeo. So agapeo is, the, is a verb, and it's almost always in the neuter gender. It doesn't have a gender associated with it. This is, this is in the Greek, so I'm giving you a bit of Greek. But I, I, the only reason I want to do that is because everybody goes to the Greek in order to justify something. So I did exactly the same thing in order to try and find out what the distinctions are. So the word agapeo is always in the, almost always in the neuter form and it's almost always a verb. Rarely is it a noun, but sometimes. Rarely is it in the feminine form, but it is sometimes. It's only a little bit more frequently in the masculine form. It is mostly neuter in gender. That's important. That's important. And it is sometimes in the plural form, but it is, uh, and sometimes in the singular. So sometimes in the plural, sometimes in the singular. I'm not, I, didn't, I didn't go through all 220 times that it turned up, but it is, I found it almost 50-50 as far as it's, it's split. The other word, tr word translated love is the Greek word phileo. <laughs> no. There is no discernible difference in the use of those two words in the Bible. Um, they are interchangeably used in the New Testament. So anytime you hear a preacher or a theologian say the word agape means unconditional love, but phileo means brotherly love, they have just testified to you that they do not do their own studies. All they do is repeat what other people have told them. You've just heard that testimony from their own lips. They've never done their own studies, never done their own. They've never checked anybody. And when they don't check anybody, you know that all they are is basically a Russian doll version of their previous theologian. Smaller, but still in there. You know what I mean? That's all you see. Because those two words are used so interchangeably that it's impossible to sit there and say one. Let me give you one example. How can you love a chair? Do you think you can love a chair with unconditional love? Do you think you can love a chair with un unconditional godly love? Well, in the Gospel of Matthew, it's the word agape. Agapeo, they love the uppermost chairs in the highest seats. But the same phrase in Luke is phileo. Let me ask you a question. Does God love the Son? God loves the Son. It says it in John chapter 5. God loves the Son. Is it with a brotherly kind of love or is it an unconditional love? That the word is phileo. It's not agape. Do you get it? That's just one. I've got 14 of them. And if I put them on the board and you were to apply that rule, you would fail in every one, in every instant. It's garbage. They use that to take away from a particular passage when, when Jesus is actually giving Peter the opportunity to redeem himself. Do, dost thou love me? Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And they're trying to get into some other sort of form. But why did he ask him, do you think, three times, do you love me? Anybody know? He Sorry? He denied him three times. Denied him three times. He denied him three times. It takes away from that. These theologians that get into this idea. Anyway, don't get me started. Sorry. I just get ticked, you know. Just do your own studies. Please do your own studies. Look at these things. Okay. So the word love in the English Bible has many different forms. Mostly masculine. Mostly a verb. Sometimes singular. Sorry, sometimes singular, sometimes plural. Sorry, sometimes masculine, sometimes feminine. Sometimes singular, sometimes plural. Mostly a verb, mostly neuter. And this is important. It's found in the Gospels all the way through the New Testament. Charity appears 28 times in the New Testament. It is in 24 verses. The word charity never appears in the Gospel accounts. Never. It only ever appears in the church letters 
and in the pastoral epistles and once in the book of Revelation re relating to the church of Thyatira. The word charity always has the Greek word agape, not agapeo and not phileo. Agape is always in the feminine form. Important, important, always in the feminine form. And it all is always in the singular form. It is never in the plural. The only time it's ever, ever found in the plural is when it's modified by a plural before it. Um, there's one time only in the book of Jude where it speaks about the feasts of charity. The feasts of charity. It's actually not referring to the charity itself. Charity itself, it's referring to the feasts. So it has the plural form to match that. That's the only time it's plural. Next, it is always a noun. Always a naming word. It is always a noun. Beloved, there was no church when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Was there? Did the church exist? No. When did the church come into existence? Acts chapter what? Acts chapter, anybody remember? The church came into existence. Acts chapter 2, right? The beginning of the church was Acts chapter 2. That's when the, 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 you know, the tongues of fire went over their heads. That is the beginning of the church when they were all gathered together. So it stands to reason we cannot be speaking of love between brethren if there are no brethren to be speaking on. So it's not expected in the gospel accounts and it's only expected after at least the book of Acts. What is the gender of the church? Anybody? Masculine or feminine? Feminine. It's pretty hard to be a bride of Christ if you're a masculine, yeah? Okay, so the, the church is always feminine. The word church... All through the Bible, the word ecclesia is always in feminine form. And guess what? It's always a noun. And guess what else? It's always singular. It's always in the singular. It's never in the plural. Unless it's speaking about local churches. When it's speaking about the universal church, the church, now that's interesting in itself. The Bible has two forms of church. The church universal is the church that all of us and every born again believer in the world through history is a part of. We are the church universal, okay? But there are also local churches, okay? Local churches. Does this matter? Why does this matter? It matters because words matter, beloved. It matters because words matter. God wanted us to know that there is a difference between the love brethren are to have one with another and the love we have for everyone or anything else. The link between charity and the church is also unalterable. It's unchanging because the love God has for the church is unalterable and unchanging. Charity never faileth. So the love that we are to have one with another has to match the same love that the Father has for us. That's why the link is there. That's why the word charity is there. Vitally important. There is a peculiar love between brethren that all modern translations have demonstrably denied. John 13, 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The very reality that our love between one another testifies to Jesus Christ. It's to demonstrate Christ's love. It's to demonstrate Christ's love. The love between brethren resembles that of a bride and groom, a husband and wife. It is a sacrificial love. It is a relationship that is willing to do all it does to be retained forever, forever. And it is to match the love Jesus has for his church. So that is by way of introduction in that particular point. And next we see we get into the text itself. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity suffers long and is kind. You see that in verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. It's long suffering. It's long suffering. In other words, this, this love is enduring. It's not, it doesn't quit easily. It is in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It never gives up on people. It suffers long. 
It is tried. It is tested. And though there is suffering associated with this form of love, it continues unabated for a time that is seen in the text as long. Long. It suffers long. A long-suffering nature of this love is seen as the fruit of the Spirit of God. We see that in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. Clearly, what we witness here is not that such love is easy to attend to. It's not easy. It's long-suffering. And it is, again, as simple as making a choice. It's still a choice. We still have to choose it. And we choose it often against our own emotions at that time. Because why? Because we are offended. We find ourselves easily offended at times. You know? And that's, that's natural for us all. Um, what we witness here is that it is associated with the same love that Jesus has for us. Just as Jesus is long-suffering in his love toward us, so are we to be for the brethren. I don't know if you can remember that passage in the Bible where Jesus is with the disciples and the disciples are expressing faithlessness. You know, A perverse and adulterous generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? That's Jesus speaking to his disciples. You know? So you can see that the love even of Christ at that time is long suffering. He is suffering their faithlessness, you know, and he does the same with us, beloved. You know, he is suffering our faithlessness and he, it is a long suffering love and it's the same love we are to have one with another. This is charity. This is what that word means. This is given to you and I. It is also there to cover our sins against our Lord. So that way we can give this same love that it might cover the sins of those who sin against us. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 and have a look at this for yourself. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 8 to 10, Peter writes, And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. What we have from God, we are to minister to others. What we've received of the Lord, we minister to others. The same thing when it comes to those that sin against us, we minister grace to, to others. We give people room to grow. It's part of our room to grow. We all sin one against another at some time in our life. And I think anybody that thinks otherwise aren't really doing what David did and going on their knees before the Lord. This is charity. This is charity. This is a love that suffers long and is kind and is kind. It's kind. It's not cruel. It considers those who are the object of charity rather than itself. It is not love for love's sake, but love for the sake of the care of others. When it comes to the brethren, it is kind. When it comes to our enemies, it is to resemble the very nature of God on high. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We looked at this last time and this is the nature of love. Luke chapter 6. And the link, again, the love that we are to have, even for our enemies, is to be matching the love between us and the Father, the love that the Father has for us. Luke chapter 6, the Gospel of Luke. And there in verse 35. And the link, again, the love that we are to have, even for our enemies, is to be matching the love between us and the Father, the love that the Father has for us. Luke chapter 6, the Gospel of Luke. And there in verse 35, Jesus spoke there saying, But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great and you shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. Romans, Paul tells us in Romans 12, 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honour, preferring one another. Brotherly, did you say that? Brotherly love. Do you reckon God can say brotherly love? 
I think he can say brotherly love. I don't think you need to get into the Greek to work out brotherly. He can say brother. Anyway, oh, sorry. I'll cut that later. Please, Emilio, we'll just chop, cut. In other words, we are to prefer our love for another above love for ourselves. This kind of love, this kind of affection and preference is one that can only be naturally affected the more we come to grow in our relationship to the Lord. It's not natural. Loving somebody else more than we love ourselves is not natural. (laughs) If you've ever tried it, you'll know that you have to force yourself to do it, all right? You have to force yourself to do it. I remember as a tradie, there were certain switches, they're called, uh, they're electrical switches, that they are geared that once the circuit breaks, it just clicks straight off, right? So once the circuit breaks, it just clicks straight off. And you have to apply pressure to put it into its, its proper position in order for the current to be able to flow. Well, we are naturally just, we switch off. We're just naturally spring-loaded in the wrong direction. But in order for love to flow, we need to actively push that switch up. We need to actively love someone more than we love ourselves. It's not natural. The scriptures say that thou shalt love thy neighbour, what? As thyself. There's a bit of a presumption there, don't you think? It's telling us that we already naturally love ourselves. And just in case you were curious, I've given you the scripture references there, but that same text is found in Leviticus 19, 18, Leviticus 19, 34, Matthew 19, Matthew 22, Mark chapter 12, Luke chapter 10, Romans chapter 13, Galatians chapter 5, and James chapter 2. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall everything be established. We naturally love ourselves. We are naturally spring-loaded to loving ourselves. We have to make effort to love somebody else. This is part of, of that long suffering, but it's also kind. We simply cannot love others as we do ourselves. That's not natural. If we are not growing in our knowledge of the love of, of God and the love of God and realizing his incredible love for us and how often we fail, we cannot have the patience to endure those that sin against us and to love those that, that are perhaps unlovable in the eyes of many. We have to make the effort. You know, it, it doesn't seem like God needs to make an effort because God is love. You know, but we, we, we still have the flesh nature. We still seem to have to make a conscious effort to love those who may not love us in return. But you know, I'm not talking about enemies here. We're just talking about brethren. We simply cannot love as we do ourselves if we're not growing in our knowledge and love of the Lord. We certainly cannot place our love for others above ourselves without trusting that God desires this of us, just as he had done for us. Beloved, this is the very reason why the first sermon in this series was to be honouring to trust him first. We trust him at his word first. Is this simple? Yes, it's a simple command. Is it easy to do? No, it's not easy to do. No, it's not easy to do. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity does not envy. In that same verse, it says, Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Loving others is the opposite to loving ourselves. Envy is the opposite of loving others. It is envy in the heart that goes before the act. Envy in the heart is what goes before the act. It was envy of his brethren that sold, it was the envy of his brethren that sold Joseph into Egypt in Genesis 37, 11 and Acts chapter 7, verse 9. It was envy, beloved, that the leaders of the Jews delivered Jesus Christ, our Lord, to be crucified. Matthew 27, verse 18. It is envy that identifies the carnal Christian. 1 Corinthians 3.3, and envy that is associated with the damned soul that has rejected God in Romans 1.29. And it is envy that perfectly describes our previous life in Galatians chapter 5, verse 21. Sadly, it remains to be that it will be envy that in one form or another will be a cause that separates churches. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. Always keep, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians there. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. Paul writes there saying, For I fear, lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, 
but that I shall but that I shall be found shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, and lest when I come again my God will humble me among you, that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. But note something, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church. Is it kindly, loving, pillow fluffing? It's not, is it? He's charging them with fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. He's telling them that, you know, he would love to come to them uh, as he would in kindness and love, but he may find them, he may, from their perspective, he's going to come to them such as they would not. And that is in anger and in strife is what he's referring to here because he's rebuking the Corinthian churches for what they've been doing and allowing to permit within their churches. But notice that it's envyings is one of the causes that actually separates churches. It is envy that desires positions of prominence rather than the care and love of others. Paul wrote of this to the Galatians saying, let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another, envying one another in Galatians chapter 5, verse 26. It was the Apostle John writing to Gaius, a pastor of one of the churches in his third epistle, speaking of Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among those in his church. And he was unwilling to receive the brethren of the Lord for the envy or authority that he lusted after in 3 John 9 to 10. It's only a one page letter. The love of the brethren does not need to envy. Brethren, as brethren, we do not need to envy. We do not need to envy the possessions of other brethren. We do not need to envy anybody within the church. Anybody that has the eternal riches of heaven to look forward to, we do not need to envy. Because there is nothing to envy, beloved. Nothing. We all have had our lives prior to coming to Christ. We've all experienced our own lives prior to coming to Christ and even since coming to Christ. We all have our struggles. We all have our positives. We all have our negatives. We all have our possessions and some do not have possessions. But I can almost guarantee you everybody in this church has something more than somebody else. Something more than somebody else. And there is no need to envy. Not, not, not when you've got all the treasures of heaven. Not when you have all of that. There's no need to envy. Paul, I loved his passage in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. Like you have everything. Like everything. You know what I mean by everything? Everything. You already have it as your present possession. It is inheritance already set aside. The only thing you can do, if you choose to do, is add to the treasure. Do you store the treasure there? Not here. Not here. There. If you want to, you can add to the treasure there. And I guarantee you, once we're all in heaven, there won't be any envying there either. You know? Because everybody will know we all have that which we have earned here. Beloved, you've got a direct connection to eternity. Do you know that? It's not what you did a second ago. It's not what you're going to do later. It's now. Right now. The thoughts that are in your mind are a direct connection to eternity. We are seated in heavenly places, the Bible says. So too it is when we choose to love our brethren. Charity seeks not her own. Verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. It's interesting. The love that brethren are to have one for another is not one identified by boasting of one's self. It's attained of things or successes. It's not because you've attained to things or you've had certain successes or because one act is over the top of another. A brother or sister in Christ does not show themselves as greater. It's not presented like the sons of Zebedee who said, grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. Mark 10.37 to the discouragement of the brethren in verse 41 of that passage. 
Charity simply does not exalt itself. It doesn't puff up. It doesn't vaunt itself. Vaunting simply means to boast of its achievements to the brethren. This sort of vanity, this sort of pretension, we're seeing a lot in the modern churches of today. People disguise their own um, inept walk with the Lord with appearances of godliness, with appearances of holiness. They look all the goods on the outside, but inside they're whitewashed tombs. And this is the reality that we have. They do this through that boasting. These vanities and pretensions abound today so sadly. And it was like the Pharisees of old that Paul wrote of with regards to the Corinthian churches. He says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Are not wise. And this is so too with us. This is not love. This is vain. This is vanity. This is self-love. This is envy. And they hide behind this as a mask. They have much praying, but there's little content to their prayers. Many high and exuberant words of holiness, but no heart behind them. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof, says the apostle. And from such turn away, he also writes in 2 Timothy 3.5. Beloved, there is always a risk that you and I can be in this state of lovelessness. Why? Because... You see, our walk is moment by moment, you know. I don't know if you realise that. Your walk is moment by moment. And this is one of the things that we have to understand with one another. Our walk is moment by moment. Because we find ourselves in a struggle or in a sin or anything at any given moment in time, that doesn't identify us if we are in Christ. It just says that's where our brother, that's where our sister, that's where our pastor is at this particular moment in time. It doesn't identify us. And that's one of the reasons why we have to have grace one with another. Why we have to express love, even though at that particular moment, we are unlovable. We are unlovable. We have no idea the different circumstances that are going on in each one of our lives at any moment in time. The different pressures, the different struggles, family issues, work issues relationship issues. We've dropped our Bible. We're not reading it anymore. We can't even find where it is. It might have accumulated dust. It might still be on the back parcel shelf of the car on the way back from church last month. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, we we can't be judging one another in these things. We are to love one another. There are things that we are to judge. Yes, we are. There's no question. But not those things that are not evident. We are to prefer one another, Paul wrote in Romans 12.10. 1 Corinthians 4, he says, And these things, brethren, have I in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, and that no one of you be puffed up one against another. Turn your Bibles to Philippians as we finish this point. Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 5. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfil ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves." Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And the link again between our relationships one to another to the relationship that Jesus Christ had with us is there. It's seen there in, the, in this epistle. You know, he humbled himself, made himself, the Bible says, of no reputation that he may exalt you in time to come and save your souls. Thinketh no evil. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. In the first 5 it says, Does not behave itself, doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Okay, I need you to listen really carefully here. There is one act that not only Christians, but family members do one to another that is near impossible 
to reconcile without utter humility. And it is when one thinks evil against another. This is by far the single most hurtful act of all when people are judged for perceived wrongs as opposed to real wrongs. This is not judging righteous judgment. This is when people think they know what you're thinking and then employ what they think you're thinking against them. You see the madness in the, in the entire concept. And each one of us have been hurt in some way or another and most likely each one of us has hurt somebody in this same fashion. You know, we think we know what someone's thinking and then we make a judgment against them about what we think they're thinking. It's madness when you think about it, you know, and yet we have a tendency of doing this and this is evil. Nobody has been hurt more but in Christian churches when this is accounted for. Why? Because it is the exact opposite of what we're supposed to be doing. These are the times when Christians leave churches because they've been so hurt by the people thinking evil against them in the churches and never go back. Never go back. Because everything that they thought a Christian church was is completely turned inside out within their minds and they will be decades before they ever go back to a church again because they refuse to be judged in that same way. Why? Because the heart was judged. Who has the right to judge the heart? Only God knows the heart, beloved. Only God knows all the circumstances that come behind that heart. Maybe the person said something out of order. And maybe that person said something out of order at a time where you were very weak in your own faith or that you were very feeling very, very insecure at that time and you were personally hurt by it and as a result of that, there ended up being judgment on your part against them. Beloved, we can't afford this. We can't afford this. This is one of the greatest evils of all within a church when we think evil against another. When we think evil. No, no actual evidence, no actual evil have been done. Certainly no willingness to let that ball go through to the keeper. No, no, we've got to bat that one back. We've got to hit that one for six. We want to make sure that that person knows exactly what we think of what they just said. You know, no, no, you can let it go. You can let it go. It's not going to hit the wicket. You can let it go. Let it go. You know, let it go in love. Have that charity. Families, as in churches, it's one act that begins in the mind and is ultimately expressed by the tongue and becomes a fire that sets the course of hell, says James. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Thinking evil against others comes from nowhere else but hell. It comes directly from Satan. Please remember, we are in a spiritual war. This is a spiritual battle. And Satan desires nothing if he does not desire to split churches and to set Christians against Christians. Why? Because it's the exact opposite of what Jesus said. Love between you will demonstrate you are of me to them that are without and if Satan can get in there and he can have Christians fighting one with another, how does that demonstrate Christ to the world? Doesn't, does it? They look at the church and they go, mate, you guys are no different to my footy club. You know? The no difference is you guys don't have pie night. You know? That usually comes with beers. So, you know, we could have pie night if you like, but we've got to X the beers, you know? So, beloved, this e thinking evil, it's just... It is one that presumes malevolent intent in the heart of somebody else. So thinking evil presumes malevolent intent in the person who is the target of that focus. And very sadly, it is always, always, always done in Christian circles by individuals who have backslidden in their faith or who are in currently, presently in the bond of iniquity. I've never seen it otherwise. I've never experienced it myself other than then either. I'm talking from practical experience as well as what the scripture teaches. The only time I find myself thinking evil of others is when I myself have also backslidden. I'm not growing in my faith as I should be, you know, and I find myself thinking evil of individuals. 
And husbands, you may see this. Sorry, ladies. But husbands, you may see this often with the ladies. You may often see the ladies, you know, you get home and next thing you know, there's the talk going on. Oh, did you see what so-and-so said? Did you hear what so-and-so said? Did you see what so-and-so was wearing? Did you look at this? Did you see that? Now, if you are men, and I mean real men, you need to put a stop to that. It is a tendency, we see it all through scripture with, with, with the ladies, even in the Bible. You've got to be careful with these sort of things because those things are the little ignition that starts the fire and those things will set the course of the fires of hell within those relationships. You need to put a stop to it and say, there's no evidence for that. You're saying these things out of turn because you're feeling the way you're feeling. You know, we can't be talking like that about the brethren. We can't be dealing with it that way. Men, you have the opportunity to quench that fire, but if you don't, it will just continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And that's all of us. That's all of us. You know, we all have to deal with that. Those who have a close relationship with the Lord never pretend to know what is in the mind of another person. When a questionable act or statement is made, they presume innocence until they can prove guilty. And this is an interesting thing that happens all the time as well, that those who think malevolent thoughts with regards to you, thinking that they know what you're thinking, want you to prove that you're innocent. Well, what was your motive behind that? You know, well, hang on a second. What do you think my motive was behind that? I think your motive was X. Prove it. You need to prove it. If that's what you think the motive was, then prove it. You see, what happens with this sort of mentality is a reverse burden of proof. I had a meeting with a pastor, a chance meeting down a hallway with a pastor who was part of the, 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 the churches that we had separated from with regards to the camps, right? He used to be a lawyer and he was charging me with evil, right, in what I did because they never asked me why we set up the camps that we set up, right? And if you're listening, this is for you, brother. Um, I never got asked, I never got approached, I never got asked by people who were thinking evil of this church for why we set up those camps. No one ever asked us. They simply accused, judged, condemned and disenfranchised us completely. To this day, I have never had a question coming from them saying, what was your intention with regards to those camps, brother? Tell me about those camps. What are you doing with those camps? They thought we were in competition against them. And I spoke to this particular pastor, chance meeting, in Backers Marsh, in a hallway going to the toilet. Can you believe it? Not, or not? We passed each other and he looks at me and goes, hey, Eddie. I'm like, hey, brother. And we sat there and talked and he charged me with this sin. And I said, did you ever come and ask? Doesn't the Bible say if you've got aught against the brother, you are to go to the brother? You know what he said to me? Oh, I don't see it that way. Hang on, What? <laughs> You're a pastor. It says if you've got anything against a brother, you are to bring it to them. You say you don't see it that way? What other way is there to see it? So remember a number of years ago, Julia Gillard was the prime minister of the country. There was an act that she wanted to put into place where it was going to be illegal for anybody to feel, for you to offend anybody. Hang on. Offend in the Bible is an actual offence, right? When you commit an offence, it's an actual crime. It's testable, it's provable, it's observable. But this was a different sort of law. If an individual feels offended, you have to prove that you didn't intend to offend them. You got it? That is a reverse burden of proof. And sadly, this is also something that happens within churches a lot these days where there is a reverse burden of proof demanded of those for whom they feel offended by. You got it? You make, make sense? We can't do this. We can't do this. This is something that is not part of the scope of reality. It's not part of the scope of scripture. There is a lack of humility when people are going through times of insecurity. Insecurity is often revealed through pride. Those who are puffed up are also proud. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, saying, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Those who are prideful, those who are puffed up, those who also are the same as those who are insecure, and they all despise having their belief respecting themselves deflated. I've got a relative exactly the same state. She thinks 
incredibly highly about herself and unfortunately she forces me to try and walk on eggshells and none of us can. It's interesting that insecurity and pride and knowledge seem to come together in an incredible way. I remember Chuck Missler, Dr Chuck Missler, uh, quoting this verse by Paul and said that the greatest sign of insecurity are those with PhD before their names. <laughs> he said that several times through several different messages until he got an honorary doctorate for his 80,000 word book, Cosmic Codes. And I remember that because I was, I was full on into Chuck Missler when he was, he was a blessing to me, a real blessing to me. Godly man, godly ministry, wonderful teaching, a few things that are very, a bit skew if, but overall, I, I really enjoyed his teaching. And he, he was the one that gave me just such excitement of the word of God. You know, that was, that was Dr. Missler, you know, and, and Lord, Lord be with him and he's with the Lord now, which is a wonderful blessing. But, uh, but I love that, that, I remember that, that quote that he gave, you know, it's so true. Unrepentant sin in the heart of man is the single greatest cause of insecurity in one's life. Unrepentant sin in the heart of man is the single greatest cause of insecurity in one's life. The more you sin, the more you have, try, have to try to hide your sin from the Lord. And the more you need to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. The more highly you think of yourself, the more you need the affirmation of others so that you can vaunt yourself, so that you can boast of all that you do. And the more you are not checked in this vanity, the more secure you become in self-conceit. And there is a rolling on effect. And the more you are in self-conceit, the more emotionally insecure you are. And you have essentially built up a Jenga tower for yourself without even realising it. People around you need to learn the dangerous but futile act of walking on eggshells. Because at any moment, such a person will begin to think evil of you. And at any moment, that tower of self-conceit will fall on friends, relatives and brethren. Sadly, the Bible teaches us that such will be the evident sign that we are living in the last day's church. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Pastoral epistles to the pastor Timothy. It's after the Thessalonian books. You'll get to 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, that is, without self-control. So the old-fashioned meaning of the word. Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Beloved, this is a description of the last day's church. It's not a description of the world. The world has always been this way. It has never not been this way. This it is a description of the last day's church. Paul was writing this pastoral epistle to a pastor. And this is what he speaks of concerning the behaviour of many in the time that we seem to be now living in, the last days, which perilous times have come. Such as these behave in opposition to that of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and prove perfectly, verses 4 to 7, as anything but charity. Charity suffereth long, and is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. No, beloved, no. Such people as these are easily provoked, and they think evil against those whom they believe have provoked them. They will not rejoice in the truth. They can certainly bear no such thing as the truth. They do not believe all things. They do not hope all things. And last of all, they will not endure all things, but will be brought under great sorrow of heart. And they will not even endure sound doctrine. Go forward one chapter to the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy. Same epistle, same pastor, same author, 
Next chapter. Paul writes and says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. In verse 2 it says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. My, what a time to be a pastor. What a time to be a pastor in those last days. The last point this morning, charity never faileth. Charity never faileth. Verse 8 in our text in 1 Corinthians 13, Charity never faileth. But where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Charity, however, never faileth. Did you see that? Never. Never. Never fails. It never fails. When your best friend hurts you, love them. They are not your enemy. When your brother or sister hurts you, Love them. They are not your enemy. When your cousin or your work colleague hurts you, love them. They also are not your enemy. When your brethren hurt you, love them. They, like you, have been bought with a price. They, like you, have a wrestling with the flesh and have a devil walking about them like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Love them. They are not your enemies. Beloved, we live in the most incredible time of all history. More has been written about the days that we are living in within the scriptures than any other time in history, save that time of the captivity of Israel. We are living in the last of the last days. The battle that we fight today is a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual war. There is, I believe, coming a latter rain, a time when the gospel is going to be preached because we have nothing else left within our lives to hold on to but the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to be ready for the wonderful work. In the meantime, Satan is going to do everything he can in these days to disrupt your love. But you see, just as the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church, so too charity never faileth. The same love that purchased the church has within it permanent love and perpetual grace that will last for all eternity. It may be true that some relationships are separated today that will not be reconciled today, maybe not until heaven. But I can tell you right now, the moment the doors of forever open, the moment the doors of forever open, we are all going to be embracing one another with the greatest joyful embrace that we have ever had before. All those things that we fought and bickered for and against on the earth are going to be seen as absolutely nothing. But also they're going to be seen from the perspective of heaven and from the perspective of eternity, what they were, what motivated the where, where they come from. Charity never faileth. It's simple, but it ain't easy. It's simple, but it ain't easy. It's something we've got to make effort to do and I would encourage you please make effort with your brethren to do just that just for the sake of eternity for the sake of heaven and for the sake of the gospel of Christ that it be not hindered God bless you let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you Lord what a wonderful relationship what a rela wonder wonderful relationship we have when we are reconciled to you what a wonderful relationship we can have in our love one, one toward another in representation of that same love that you have for us. I praise you, dear Lord, for it. And I pray, dear Lord, for my brethren. I pray, dear Lord, for those that have blessed you and desire in every way to grow in you. And I pray, dear Lord, for each one of us, and me included, dear Father, that you would forgive our own sins. I thank you, dear Father, for your wonderful joy that you've given to us, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his long suffering and patience toward us, because we know in whom we have believed and we are persuaded that he is able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day. We rejoice, dear Father, in that wonderful preservation of our souls and inheritance, dear Lord, that is undefiled. We give you thanks for these and we give you thanks for this day and thanks for our brethren. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.